I am Michael Santos with PrisonProfessors.com, and today I have the distinct privilege and honor of introducing you to Judge Stephen Boo from the Western District of Missouri. I met uh, Judge Boo through my friend and partner, Sean Hopwood, and I asked him if he would come on our program to speak a little bit about sentencing and what steps an individual can take to uh, influence or have a positive influence on the jury. And so, Judge Boo, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to spend some time with us. And I'd just like to ask you in the beginning, start with the first question, and that is, what information do you consider prior to sentencing, prior to that all-important date for a defendant? Well, first, let me tell you, thanks for having me on, the, on your program. And um, I've enjoyed talking about this to other organizations, bar associations, so I'm glad to talk about it with you. Uh, I'm a little bit unique that I have both sides file sentencing memorandum. Um, and make a mandate that they each address the 3553 factors. Uh, I think having both sides know that I'm attuned to that and want advocacy on that is important. Other things that I review are often could be letters, it could be a thumb drive of a video or something that's on that point. And I think what I've told lots of lawyers is that, you know, I travel around the entire Western District of Missouri. Sometimes I'll do eight sentencing in one day in Jeff City and get in the car at five o'clock and drive to somewhere else um, to do more sentencing. To, uh, to keep it on schedule, I need to know ahead of time what I'm dealing with. And I can watch a video that's been produced or you know, look at a PowerPoint beforehand, and I promise I do it, um, that I'm, it's not just a thumb drive sitting out there. And I can do that and stay on schedule. You mentioned the factors 3553. For those in our audience that aren't familiar with, with those factors, can you elaborate a little bit on what they mean? Yeah, so uh, 18 U.S.C. 3553 is a, a statute that governs sentencing. And so what every federal judge has to do is, one, properly calculate the sentencing guideline. And then, two, apply the 3553 factors. And so... Clearly, the sentencing guidelines um, are generic. They have nothing to do with the human that's in front of you. The 3553 factors say, now look at this person like a human, not like a grid on, on the back page of the sentencing guidelines. And so the 3553 factors, honestly, there's something for everybody. If a judge wants to sentence somebody harshly, there's a factor for that. If a judge wants to see, sentence someone leniently, there's something for that too. And so you look at the history and characteristics of the defendant. You look at what happened in this particular crime. What's a just punishment? How do you deter? How do you rehab? It's, in, it's, the, it's the antithesis. It's the opposite of the sentencing guidelines. Now I've got to look at you and your crime and your background and what do you need to end up being a successful citizen of our country. And although a defendant can't change the past, the bad decisions that he may have made that put him in the crosshairs of a prosecutor and in the Department of Justice, what steps have you seen defendants make that have made a favorable impression upon you when you're considering those factors? Yeah, it takes me back to what a former U.S. attorney and who's now a district judge has told me. There's really only two kind of crimes. There's a crime that I'm mad at you, and there's a crime that I'm scared of you. And so I'm going to talk about, hopefully put it in the category, I'm mad at you. You've used drugs. You've run from a cop. You had a gun. As opposed to I'm scared of you, you produce child pornography. So um, I think when you, when you look at that, if you're a federal judge and you're sentencing somebody, you want to know that somebody's genuinely remorseful for what they've done. And so... I've had times where, you know, well, Judge, I want you to pass along my apologies to somebody. I'm like, I'm not in the business of passing along apologies. You could have done that before. You've already pled guilty. You had 90 days. Um, you could have reached out and had restorative justice all on your own. You don't need me to do it. You don't need me to order it. Um, there are folks who know I'm in charge of my reentry program. And so, we have a relapse prevention program there in the reentry program that spells out things that say, here's how I got 
into this trouble. Here's the things, the factors that lead me to use drugs or lead me to make these bad decisions. Here's the people. And I've had people fill out the relapse prevention plan because they have thought about how they got there, the things in their life that got them there, and the things they're going to do that they're going to do to improve themselves regardless of what my sentence is. And so coming in and being genuinely remorseful and not just saying I'm sorry to everybody in the courtroom, but knowing who the victims are and, and trying to heal that regardless of my sentence and to truly self-evaluate themselves and figure out how they got in this spot and start making conscious efforts to improve. When you, you spoke about remorse quite a bit there, and I know a lot of times defense attorneys will articulate the remorsefulness of the client. What type of weight do you put on a defense attorney's statement about the defendant's remorse? I don't want to say zero, but I'm up there at about one and two percent. Um, most of the time I'm paying that defense lawyer, whether they're a public defender or CJA attorney. I expect them to do that. Uh, what is much more meaningful to me, and I believe most of the other judges that I know, is if you believe that that defendant is truly remorseful and given some thought about it. Um, and it's one of those things, it's just like if your kid throws a baseball through your window and you say, I'm sorry, that's one thing. If the kid throws a baseball through the window and is busy cleaning it up and doesn't try to blame it on Bobby next door as a contributing somebody, but I'm fixing it and I really know what I've done here, and I've thought about it, and I can see how it's affecting you and others. Um, that's really meaningful. And you can usually see it. I mean, not that federal judges have some special power to tell if somebody's saying BS or not, but there's a speech that I think every public defender gives every defendant, and if you repeat that speech, that's not real meaningful. Um, but you can tell when somebody's given some thought that, hey, I realize that I've hurt somebody else, and that somebody else may be my kid, maybe my wife, maybe somebody else. Here's how I understand that I have damaged somebody else in this process. And even if they're just selling some small quantity of drugs to feed their own habit, they've damaged other members of society and caused hurt to someone else's family. And so recognizing your actions go beyond yourself and you saying you're sorry is a lot more meaningful than the public defender or CJA attorney saying you're sorry. And in your experience, how, how frequently do you see defendants really invest the time and the energy to communicate that remorse to you? Is that something that you see a lot of or is that something that you would like to see more of? I'd like to see more of it. I mean, to answer your initial question, I mean, I can probably count on one hand. I've been on the bench about three years. Um, I can count on one hand where I I was genuinely moved by somebody's apology. They really recognized it, not just a check mark of the box. I'm supposed to say I'm sorry. I'm supposed to say this, and I'm supposed to say this. But a true introspection and thinking about how they got there, um, I think, is pretty valuable. It's valuable for all of us, right? I mean... It's what they taught you in Sunday school, thinking about how to, how did my actions affect others, and not just say I'm sorry, but to to go about trying to remedy that. Um, and you know, a lot of times we talk about in some cases and some jurisdictions they have restorative justice type programs that try to put people together to heal that that divide. Um, you don't need an order to do that. You just need a pen and a piece of paper and it to be genuine, and I think most humans have the capacity to forgive and to move on. Sometimes defendants talk, talk to us about saying that their, their defense attorneys do not want them to talk in court, and if that's the case, would, would you have any guidance for a defendant whose, whose defense attorney is saying, I don't want you to prepare this lengthy statement of remorse, for appeal reasons or for something else. And sometimes the defendant really wants to express that, but on advice of counsel, he doesn't do it. Do you have any guidance for somebody who faces that dilemma? Yeah, I think first one, really ask why. 
you know, try to figure out what that is. Sometimes um, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to defend it talking either. And it has nothing to do with an appeal. It's because that person isn't remorseful and hasn't given some thought and feels like they're the victim um, and hasn't owned up to their situation. Well, that could hurt you. You know, that, that could really hurt a defendant to go in. So it may be the criminal defense lawyer saying, you're not in a state of mind that will be advantageous in your sentencing. If it's for an appeal pur purpose, that's something, a whole other avenue, and you don't want to mess up an appeal, but at least in my district, we're close to 95% guilty plea rates. So we have very few trials, and that doesn't come up a whole lot. So that, that's an outlier. So I, I'd really would want to ask why I'd like to do this. I've heard it can be effective in my case. Is there something that I'm doing that makes it not advantageous for me to stand up? Many defendants also express a great fear of speaking in front of a courtroom. Do they, do they, does it have the same movement for you if they take the time to write out their narrative and their introspection and what they've learned from this process? Or do you only value the allocution statement at sentencing? Um, I've seen it both ways. Uh, I think anybody who stood in front of a federal judge to be sentenced should be nervous, right? I mean, that's, that, that's the proper emotion. Um, so if you're not nervous, there's something wrong. Um, so being nervous and writing it out and reading it can be just as powerful. And I've seen that several times. I had a case the other day where the defendant couldn't read it. She started breaking down. I'm like, would you like me to read it? Yes. Would you like me to read it out loud? Yes. So I read it out loud. Um, I, I know there's some, there are some judges that, you know, can't tolerate a tear in the courtroom. I'm not happen to be one of them. It's not that those are bad judges, but I understand that it's a very emotional process. And so if you need to write it out, great. If you can't write it out, that's great. I even had a woman who she was terrified and nobody, government, prosecutor, pub, probation officer said she could ever really talk in public. And so what they did was part of her allocution was trying to show here's where I've come from, here's the house I was raised in, this is the miserable place that I still reside, here are these issues and here's my kids. Um, and they just had her narrate it at the attorney's office. So that, so that that PowerPoint that they sent me on a thumb drive beforehand allowed her that opportunity to talk because she couldn't say more than yes or no to the U.S. attorney, the probation office, or her defense lawyer most times. And so finding a way to address that, whether it's in a written form or standing up and speaking, you know, this is not the presidential state of the union. You don't have to act like it's memorized. I think more important is that it's heartfelt. Have you, does that, that sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you received a video type of recording. Is that an, a, an appropriate uh, delivery method then for an allocution statement is through video? I think it can be. I, I think it'd be the outlier, a really unique situation. This particular defendant um, had some issues that, that she was never able to really speak out. And, and that kind of put her in, their argument was that put her in the situation that she was in to be manipulated for the crime that was there. So I think it can be, and I think it, it can be part of an allocution. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of them want to turn this into a 60 minutes program. But for individual, every case should be individualized. And so in an individual case, if there's something somebody wants to show me in the quickest and most effective way is to have a five-minute video with it narrated by different people to explain the situation, and they send it to me beforehand, I got a thumb drive on my desk right now for a sentencing tomorrow that I'm going to go back and watch uh, and look at the things they want me to because that's the most effective way for the the defendant to tell their story. Now, obviously, the U.S. attorney is going to get a copy of it too, but it's I'm willing to look at something to 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 allow someone to argue their issue. Can you describe a situation where you went into a 
hearing, a sentencing hearing with one idea of what you were going to impose <clears throat> and received an allocution at the hearing that caused you to reassess either upwards or downwards at the, at the hearing itself. And so obviously you and I have had this scheduled for a little while, so I've been thinking about those precise issues. Um, literally this week, uh, I had one where I upwardly varied over what I thought I was going to give when I walked in. Um, I told my staff I was going to give one thing, and, and I ended up giving an additional 40 months. It was, a, uh, it was a child pornography distribution and production case. And I, I ask a series of questions when we walk in. Um, about the guidelines, because that's the first thing I'm supposed to calculate. And so I asked the defendant, have you had an opportunity to the review the PSR? And he said, yeah. But from the get-go, um, it was a negative impression. You know, so most people understand that federal judges are given an enormous amount of respect. Deserved or not is not the question, but that's what we're used to. We're given an enormous amount of respect, and people stand when we walk in the room, or yes, sir, and no, sir, and I try to do the same, yes, sir, and no, sir, to people. So from that very beginning, if, there's, if that's off, if people aren't treating everybody with respect, then that hurts somebody. Um, and, and, the, and an allocution is an opportunity for somebody to say, I've recognized what I've done is wrong. And here's how I'm going to try to make amends to my victims and how I'm going to try to make amends in the future and change my life path. And so if you don't do that, then you're missing out on a piece of advocacy that uh, is essential to the case. You have a constitutional right to it. Um, and everybody has an opportunity to talk. And so if you don't take advantage of that, it's missing, right? So it's this important part of what we expect in, in a sentencing um, that's missing. And so I've seen lots of times where somebody, I mean, each judge is different too, right? I mean, so you got to know your judge. And in knowing your judge, knowing their background, talking to your lawyer about it, you know, talking to guys that you maybe meet in the jail, but no, almost none of those guys, if it's, if it's pre-sentencing, will have been sentenced. They've been sentenced and then moved out. So getting to know a little bit about your judge is helpful. And then understanding that, okay, I can come in and, and if I'm genuine and I really have tried to figure out what I did and how I got here and the things I can do to address that, um, I vary down really. I, I vary down when, when I truly can understand somebody's situation and um, take kind of that anger out of the equation and you take in uh, lawyers are some of them are really good about okay yeah yeah we know this was horrible we're giving it to you this particular action was horrible mm -hmm. but let's put it in perspective you know don't diminish the the bad thing that was done but try to put it in perspective and those when you that's done effectively then there's not the anger from the sentencing judge to vary upward mm -hmm. So, so many of the people who go to prison or are charged with crimes have financial matters, and there are, there are victims of financial crimes. To what extent does uh, it move you if a, if a defendant strives to make a payment toward restitution even before he or she was sentenced? Does that have any influence on you? They, he knows that he did wrong. He's trying to get, make something back, even if it's a nominal amount, selling his car or doing whatever he can to say, I want to make things right with the victim. Does that, does that effort move the needle in any way? Yeah, I'm sure it does. And I think it's one of those situations where recognize genuine, you know, not, not some made up fix, but if there's been a genuine recognition that what I've done is wrong, and I'm genuinely going to go out of my way to fix this, and I'm genuinely going to be apologetic, then a genuine effort to address those harms is always meaningful. And again, this is nothing new. It's nothing that our moms or dads or grandma or grandpa hadn't taught us. You know, if you break the window, you fix it. You don't blame it on Bobby. You go in and fix it, and if it costs more money than you got in your pocket to fix it, 
then you volunteer to mow the lawn or feed the dog or whatever you've got to do to make this right. And knowing that it's not somebody, no way in the victim's fault, I'm going to make it right to whatever the victim says needs to be done to make it right. And I'm going to start right now. Judge, I would have really valued that type of guidance at the start of my journey. Those who know my story know that I made really bad decisions when I was arrested. The only thing that I wanted was to get out of prison. And I was foolish enough to believe that I could get out by going through trial. It wasn't in my case until after I was convicted at trial that I really recognized the harm that I had caused in society. I was influenced by Socrates that really changed the way that I started to think about what I did and what I could do to reconcile with society and make amends for the bad decisions I made when I was 20. But many people who go to trial, they are under the impression that it's too late. They cannot express remorse now, even though they may want to do it. In, in, in your position of sitting on the bench, my question is, if somebody has pleaded not guilty and went through a trial, and I know that it's a very small percentage in your courtroom, can that person still do something to make amends and to reconcile and say, I was wrong, I wish I got this message sooner, I didn't, or does that come across to you less plausible? Yeah, and I think we've got a whole variety of folks that kind of fit into that equation, right? And I've had a trial where the guy said, I'm guilty for selling drugs, but that gun ain't mine. And so going into trial on that case by saying, I'm guilty of the drugs, I'm not guilty of the gun, then he's lost nothing in in the credibility standpoint. There's other folks that maybe truly are innocent, and then they will have not lost anything in that situation. And I, you know, I pray to God that we don't convict innocent people, but I know that that does, if it happens once, it happens too much. And then there's other folks that are not at that point, and maybe you were at, the, at that stage or not, where you can't own up to it. Um, I think at any point when somebody owns up to a problem, that's, that's better than none. If, if the person's truly guilty, and if that's what we're talking about, then owning up at any time, usually it's 90 days or more between a conviction or a change of plea and sentencing. Um, that's not that long of time. But then in other situations, it's long enough to figure out, I screwed up, I made a mistake, I've done something wrong here, and I'm committed to improving it. And I think most judges are really good about judging if that's a genuine apology and a genuine attempt to fix it versus I'm trying to shave a few years off my sentence. And I would agree that it's never too early and it's never too late to begin working toward a better life and working toward an opportunity to reconcile with society and particularly victims. What thoughts do you have on individuals who really come clean during the pre-sentence investigation report? providing a full written narrative to the probation officer that doesn't excuse their misconduct, but rather shows the influences that led that person there. Does that, when you see that at the very earliest stage, such as the pre-sentence investigation report, does that help your assessment or your deliberations over what an appropriate and fair sentence is? Yeah, it definitely does. I think it helps for a public defender or CJA counsel to be able to cite to the PSR to say, this is how it got there. You know, this person's father was never in their life. This person sold drugs at this point to get this. This person did these things, and that tells the story and puts it all in context. That's why we talked about at the beginning of this interview, the sentencing guidelines have no reflection of humanity. It's a grid. It's a chart. And I put you on an XY chart. On the other hand, the 3553 factors, that statute mandates I put a human face on the individual standing in front of me. And so if there's, if there's things in the PSR that the lawyer can cite to and that the defendant can cite to and talk about it, you're creating your own evidence at that point. For good or for bad, you're telling your 
PSR writer in the probation office. Here's everything you need to know about me and how I got here. Um, that That is good advocacy, if nothing else. It sounds like you're reiterating what, what, I, what I heard you say at the beginning of this interview and that what Sean and I are always telling people who are reading our materials is that the most important person in the sentencing hearing is the defendant himself. He shouldn't outsource all of his remorse to the defense attorney, but rather should make the investment <clears throat> of time and energy to help the judge see that individual for who he is and what influences led him there. Uh, am I correct in understanding that's what you're telling us? You're correct, and I may backpedal a little bit because the lawyer can help put that together, right? And I, at least in my district, and I can't speak to anybody else's, I have a, a lot of respect for a public defender's office and some of our frequent flyers on the CJA panel. Um, we appoint those people. We're used to seeing them. We've developed a sense of respect and um, camaraderie um, with them. And so those people can help put this in a way to explain it. The defense, the defendant has to be on it and talking about it. And it has to, I keep coming back, it has to be genuine. But most of the time, I really don't need to hear from the defense lawyer. This is, is about the defendant. And if, if, if you believe what I'm saying about the inhumanity of the sentencing guidelines and the humanity of 3553, the best person to tell that story is the defendant. Um, now, I, I, I've seen defendants that did themselves no favors by how they got up there and maybe didn't treat me respectfully and didn't own up to it um, and didn't have a plan to succeed afterwards. Uh, but I've seen plenty that have been good advocates for themselves um, by allowing me to get to know them a little bit. And, and Judge, what influence do, do character reference letters have on your decisions at sentencing? I've read that as one of our early questions. I've had 67 in one case. That's too many. 67 character references are too many. Um, I don't need the whole community, whether it's a white collar crime or someone who's been selling drugs. Uh, I, I work with a lot of folks who are trying to become judges in the state and federal system, and I encourage them, people who want to become judges, figure out who the, you know, in the state of Missouri, it may be the governor, um, in different states, it may be senators that help pick the judges. Figure out their best friends and make a connection with them. Figure out what that judge cares about. If you're a criminal defendant, don't bury the judge in 50 letters that they can't read and then they start skimming over them. You know, give them meaningful letters. So if there's somebody in your life that can really talk about your early stage and how you got there. Um, I had a sentencing this week where they developed a relationship with a psychologist that really knew them and could talk about that person in a way that said they've owned this and they know what they did is wrong and they've got a plan to move forward. So, you know, five is probably as many as you can really come up with. If all you're going to say is this guy's a really good guy and he screwed up and please go light on him, I don't need 50 of those. A couple of those are okay, but I'm looking for somebody genuine, somebody that really knows that criminal defendant, somebody that really knows how they've progressed through life and how they've progressed since being arrested, um, they can tell me there's genuine remorse and there's a genuine plan to move ahead. In what ways can expert testimony during a sentencing hearing influence your deliberations about an appropriate sanction? Does that have any, any value to you? Yeah, and it's, it's rare. Um, my, most of my criminal docket is drugs and guns. Um, but in certain cases, I think it is helpful. Um, obviously, we're going to know about that beforehand because the vast majority of cases involve public defenders and CJA folks, and so they normally have to seek leave of court to get those experts approved. But there are mitigation specialists and typically higher sentence 
sentencing guideline range cases that can be really meaningful. That, you know, figuring out that they, where they got in trouble and how they got in trouble in grade school and in high school and, and this path that led them down that way um, and then what is actually needed to fill in that gap, uh, I think it is helpful. But like I mentioned before, we keep, we keep our cases moving, so I need to know about that beforehand if that's coming at me. So I can either watch it the night before on my computer or we can make the time in the sentencing hearing to hear from that person. Um, you know, it's, it, there's, there's a little bit of an oxymoron or a contradiction. This is the most important day in a defendant's life, and I understand that. Um, I've got to keep cases moving and can't give everybody every day, the whole day. And so finding that balance and me understanding that it's the most important day in that defendant's life and that defendant understanding I've got two other guys that feel the same way that we're going to hear today and mutually respecting each other and the limits on that is important. Judge, when, when you, after you sentence an individual and they're t sentenced to the custody of the attorney general, they go into the prison system, on rare occasions, they have an opportunity to come before you again for some type of resentencing, some issues. How does their behavior in prison, can that have some influence on your decision if you have the opportunity to reassess this candidate several years later? That's enormous considerations. Um, I see it all the time. Um, we've just gone through a rash of people who've been resentenced um, based on armed career offenders and other situations that come in front of us. If somebody's in federal prison, they've had no violations. Um, that tells me they'll have no violations when they get out, which is what I want. My uh, fairy tale view of the world is that this, the sentence in the Bureau of Prisons is supposed to be the punishment aspect of it and that supervised release is where we hopefully give people some skills and support and some monitoring to make sure they generally follow the rules of society. And so if you've not had any problems in prison, my thought is you won't have any problems when you get out. And so it allows me to take a risk. It allows me to take a risk. If you had no violations on supervised release, to be removed from supervised release early maybe after a couple years of doing everything positive. I've seen letters where people have come, have spent a year pre-trial at some small county prison waiting to come, and they've developed a positive relationship with the guards and have volunteered in the kitchen and done positive things there, and the guards have greatly appreciated and did not become a character reference, but just said, Steve has done everything we've asked him to. He's gotten up early and he's worked in the kitchen and he's been a positive influence on the other inmates. Well, that's pretty darn compelling. That means you can play by the rules. And, you, and you're going to get out. I mean, there's very few people that get life. You're going to get out, and you're most likely going to be back in front of the sentencing judge if there's ever a screw-up again. Um, and to have a clean record in prison uh, is an enormous positive star in your crown. Judge, you've been very gracious with your time and you've responded to all of our questions. And I know that our audience will learn a great deal in listening from you. You are, you are telling the people exactly what we try to convey in prison professors, that it's never too early and it's never too late to begin sowing seeds for a better life. And I really want to thank you for spending the time this afternoon and sharing your wisdom with our audience. Mr. Santos, I, I appreciate you having me on. It's a, it's a distinct honor. I mean, this is one of those times that we as a society, this is us. This is we're governing ourselves. This is our democracy. Uh, the individuals that you're serving are citizens, and uh, we, can all, we can all improve and become better, and you're an important part of that. So thank you for what you do, sir. Thank you, and God bless. You too. So that was really great. I'm so grateful to